Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, and thank you all for coming. It's so nice to see so many students, faculty, professional staff, community members, alumni uh, joining us today. So we really thank you uh, for your time. My name is Colin Bader, and I am a faculty member of the UNE Planetary Health Council. Uh, since 2017, UNE has been an institutional member of the Planetary Health Alliance, uh, which is a Harvard-led consortium of more than 140 other universities, NGOs, and institutions spanning across 30 countries internationally. So UNE is a member of that uh, renowned group. And this alliance was launched through the support of the Rockefeller Foundation and the Lancet Commission on Planetary Health. And they define planetary health very expansively. They define it as the health of all human civilization in the countless ways we're both dependent upon and embedded within uh, the Earth's natural system. So with UNI's robust academic programs, our research initiatives, and our tagline of innovation for a healthier planet, uh, we are well positioned to collaborate um, across disciplines to further bridge our environmental studies, our health sciences program, and to enhance planetary health themed education, research, uh, and community partnerships. And so today's event is one such uh, intersection of <laughs> health sciences and environmental health. Um, so we're really glad to have you all here today to explore the connections between human health and activity, climate change, and the expanding habitat uh, of ticks and vector borne diseases. And one of our very own colleagues here at UNE has related expertise in this area. Uh, Dr. Megan May is an associate professor of microbiology uh, in the College of Osteopathic Medicine Department of Biomedical Sciences. And one focus of Dr. May's research and scholarship has been on emerging diseases uh, like Lyme disease and other vector-borne illnesses. Uh, and she's been working to determine how these diseases appear, where they come from, and how to predict new, new pathogens that could arise. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Megan May to the stage, who will then introduce uh, today's speaker. Thanks, Colin. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Chuck Lubelchik from the Maine Medical Center Research Institute, where he currently is a vector ecologist. He is also an instructor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Southern Maine in his copious air time. Um, Chuck has been doing research in vector distribution with the angle of looking at vector borne diseases since the early 90s with um, other, with first another institution and then with MMCRI. The lab at MMCRI is, is really unique in that they place an emphasis on community outreach, not just so that the community is aware of what they're doing and, and what sort of research is going on locally, but also so that the residents of Maine and of northern New England can have a sense for how they can manage their properties differently, how they can control their pets, how they can control pests, and um, how they can attract or dissuade birds from congregating around property. To really get at this idea of managing our supply back. Chuck comes to us with uh, with an interesting background. He's a BS in wildlife biology from the University of New Hampshire. Um, he also has an MPH from UNE. He um, is the author of over 30 peer-reviewed publications, and he's focused largely on arthropod vector distribution. So, what? species of ticks and mosquitoes are where in northern New England, how many of those are infected with various pathogens, how many of them are co-infected with multiple pathogens, how many reservoir species, birds, horses, deer, mice, things like that, are infected with different vector more pathogens, and then finally, as of April <coughs> now, uh, in the edition of PID that just came out, the flagship journal of the Center for Disease Control, um, he's part of a publication that looks at how many Mainers have actually been exposed to various vector borne diseases. So this type of work is a great intersection between ecology, <coughs> basic biomedical sciences, um, veterinary medicine, and human medicine. So it's really interdisciplinary by nature. So with that said, Join me in welcoming Chuck Belcher.
Thanks. Can, and you can hear me because I'm wired up with two different microphones, apparently. So I'm going to turn this down a little bit. Um, yeah, so um, as Megan said, I work at the Maine Medical Center Research Institute. And, and there, a lot of the lab science, the bench basic science, has the idea of what is called um, bench to bedside, meaning that you are working on biomedical sciences at the lab bench that will then get transmuted or at least brought into a clinical setting where the bedside where patients are. But our lab, we take it a step back and we actually like to add on that we are more of a backyard to bench to bedside um, because the backyard peri-domestic environments tend to have the greatest exposure for vector-borne diseases. So one thing I'm not going to really talk about in here, but at least some work that's been done in, in southern New England indicates that most of the Lyme disease that occurs does actually not occur so much from recreational activities. A lot of people have a perception that hiking, biking, walking your dog is going to expose you to Lyme disease. When in reality, really the peri-domestic environment, the, the actual exposure to ticks around your home frequently are, result in the highest number of cases, mostly because people are not taking adequate precautions if they go out on the back lawn to pull their kayak off or go to the compost pile or go to the, the garden. Um, you know, frequently it's a quick trip, 30 seconds, two minutes, five minutes, and we don't often think about getting exposed in that, in that way. Um, so for that at least, you know, we, we do have a, a, the idea that peri-domestic exposure is pretty important. But to talk about kind of more greater broad uh, areas, there are things that actually drive the distribution and the expansion of ticks. Here are three very basic ecological uh, broad categories, climate related, basic ecology, and then hosts, all of which in some way, shape, or form have an impact on the distribution and, and reproduction and the biology of ticks. Uh, in particular, nowadays we worry a lot more about climate change than we used to 20 years ago, and so certainly that can certainly affect things like survival of ticks, in, especially as they intrude into new areas. Um, as well as how those ticks actually develop and how they actually get established and reproduce. Similarly, we actually look ecologically at things like vegetation. And we have actually found that things like invasive species such as Japanese barberry or Eurasian honeysuckle actually promote tick survival and tick abundance because they, they perform a, an actual uh, very important microclimate and micro humidity for ticks to survive. And many of these invasives are here because they have been brought to the U.S. by, um, by people frequently in a form of landscape or ornamental gardening, and then they escape into the natural environment and become very present in, in the regular forest understory. And then finally, hosts. And hosts can be anything from white-footed mice, chipmunks, and migratory songbirds, which reservoir many of the tick-borne pathogens, to actually things like white-tailed deer, which even though they're not involved with pathogens, become very important for tick reproduction. Uh, they are the primary reproductive stage host for black-legged ticks, and, and so their overall abundance uh, can affect the overall tick population in, in an area. And that also does come back into, again, the human realm, because we have either directly or indirectly affected the abundance of white-tailed deer um, in, in northeastern North America in, in the last century. And so these, this uh, picture here shows a publication uh, put up by the federal CDC dated back to uh, 1998. Uh, someone by the name of Dave Dennis published this map back then looking from 07 to 96 at the distribution of Ixodes scapularis and Ixodes pacificus. These are the eastern black-legged tick and the western black-legged tick, respectively. Um, Ixodes scapularis is well known as the black-legged tick. There are a few of us who are stubborn, and because we're native New Englanders, we also refer to it as a deer tick, so I may jump back and forth between those two names. Um, but essentially what this shows is that records of this, these two ticks uh, which are the vector, the primary vectors of Lyme disease and anaplasmosis in the United States have expanded their range um, from those periods. <clears throat> and we can see in the paper published by Becky Eisen in 2016 that at the county level, a lot more people are finding uh, black-legged ticks, especially in the eastern parts of the U.S., to a lesser extent in, in the western part of the country as well. Now, some of this could be due to more uh, recognition, more increased concern, so people are actually looking for ticks more often. But there is a lot of data to suggest that this tick is actually expanding its distribution um, on its own. And another tick that we are worried about, which has not yet arrived here, but I'll go into a little bit more uh, depth later on, is uh, a tick called the Lone Star Tick, Amblyomma americanum. And as you can see from the map, Amblyomma americanum has a wide range extending into the southern U.S. However, in the last five years, it has been making increased inroads up the eastern seaboard to the point now where it is firmly established in Connecticut 
and coastal Massachusetts along the Cape, where it was not there five years ago. This tick in many ways we regard as a game changer because it is, uh, on the one hand, it's a vector of several pathogens in the southern part of the country. Uh, it is an aggressive tick that occurs in hyperabundant numbers when it gets established. So how many here actually are creeped out by ticks in general? Okay, now picture going out in the woods and actually hearing the leaves rustle from the sheer number of ticks that are out there. Add to it that this tick has eyes and will actually turn and follow you if it sees you moving. It's like a horror movie, just waiting to happen. <clears throat> and this tick actually does, this actually does occur with this tick, and it is something that we do worry about coming up the eastern seaboard, and eventually, not now, but we think eventually it will make its way into New Hampshire and also Maine at some point uh, down the road. So it is something that we are on the lookout for. Now, this slide is up here because of, um, because of this actually map in yellow, which is on the right. And this is actually a map published on the federal CDC website, which shows uh, the range from the CDC of where lone star ticks or amblyomma or americanum are actually located. And as you can see, there actually is, at the far right side of this map, a, a little smidgen of New Hampshire and Maine that shows up in yellow, indicating that we have amblyomma or americanum here. And in truth, we do, however, we do not think we have any established populations yet. Frequently, these are cases of people, Maine residents, who have gone on vacation, gone to the southern part of the U.S., acquired this tick, found it when they come back, but because of their residence location, it is actually attributed to their county of residence. So we don't think we have an established population yet, but as I'll show you in a later slide, we do know this tick is, is being imported into, into Maine um, every year. <clears throat> and the reason, one of the primary modes of transportation, so if we go back a little bit, oh, go back a little bit to this slide, uh, what we actually have in the U.S., we actually have several things called migratory flyways, where we have a, pretty much the central U.S. has a large flyway. Kind of think of it as kind of honing in on the Mississippi River, but we also have one that goes along the eastern seaboard. And every spring, right now, going on through the end of May, migratory songbirds, as they're coming up through spring migration, as they're flying in from South America, will stop and rest. And frequently those ticks, uh, those birds, especially ones that are ground nesting or ground foraging, will acquire ticks, pick them up, and then they get off on the wing. And they fly several thousand miles and in the process end up distributing ticks <coughs> as they rest during a couple days stopover or when they get to their final terminus at their breeding location. Ticks will then fall off and then seed themselves. And both scapularis, the deer tick, as well as lone star ticks are found frequently on uh, ground nesting and ground foraging birds. And so this is just some data that we have from a paper in 2011 looking at the Appledore Island banding station on the Isles of Shoals, where we can see that even small numbers of amblyoma may be imported every year. Scapularis are far more abundant, but it does mean, at least with the yellow line, we do have a small number of amblyoma coming in every year. For scapularis, this has meant that over the last 30 years, we've actually seen a gradual increase in reporting at the town level of where people are finding deer ticks or black-legged ticks. Um, and so this program, which we had until 2013, was passed along to the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Uh, so they're continuing it, but it meant that at least for a long time, we actually were able to track this tick um, and its expansion in Maine, to the point now that we see it now not regularly, but commonly in areas like down east Maine, so areas like um, north east of Acadia National Park, so Eastport, Calais, um, areas around Lubeck on the far tip of, of down eastern Maine, but then also in Arista County, areas like Holton, um, Fort Kent, Madawaska are slowly seeing these numbers of ticks increase over, over time. And so we don't think that this is by any means the final destination for ticks, or, or black-legged ticks, because they are certainly now found as well into New Brunswick and Nova Scotia uh, in addition. <clears throat> and so again, as it is expanded in Maine, we've also seen cases of disease subsequently reported. Uh, and these again are, are cases reported at the county level uh, by the CDC. And you can see the difference between 2001 and 2015, that there is um, a definite expansion in the reporting of cases as these ticks have also subsequently expanded. Now, if you look at recent maps, one thing with this data, these again are human case data reported to the states or to the federal CDC from the states. If you look at most modern maps now, you're going to find that Massachusetts has a, a big white area. Um, and that's not that Massachusetts has really done a really good job of getting rid of Lyme disease in their state. They've just stopped counting cases. 
because the sheer burden of Lyme disease, the number of Lyme disease cases that they have to follow up on, they lack the, the resources and, and time to actually hunt down and confirm cases. So as a consequence, they've actually stopped reporting. So uh, a lot of the modern maps, people will sort of Photoshop in blue across all of Massachusetts um, because Lyme is still going on there. It's not that they've gotten rid of it all, but if you look at a lot of modern maps, you'll see that it, it's a big blank area right now. Um, one of the things we do notice as well is that we do have an increase and a slight warming going on um, relating to climate. And this also has cascade effects where you may have increased precipitation. Um, the increased warming, and this is a map showing, a perspective map showing 2000 to 2009 and then 2010 to 2016, uh, showing an actual slow warming in Maine. Uh, and these are actually accumulation of degree days. And anybody here familiar, or anybody here actually do any farming or agriculture? I can raise my hand. Okay, somebody else? All right, right, I've got a small farm. Degree days are important, especially if you're growing crops, because they are sort of the, the number of uh, days above a certain degree threshold that you count. And in some cases, this is important because certain crops need X number of degree days in order to produce fruit or food. Ticks also need a certain number of degree days. Black-legged ticks need actually 1,260 um, degree days above six degrees centigrade in order to increase, um, in order to be able to, to procreate and reproduce. And so what we've actually seen is that these accumulated degree days are actually increasing across Maine. So we have more areas of the state where climate-wise, it's more hospitable for ticks to survive for them to get established and for them to reproduce and, and grow their populations. Um, and this is a direct result to some extent of climate. There are other factors as well that play into it. Um, but again, we do know, despite a lot of the current <clears throat> media, I would say hostility, I'll play this safely, hostility to climate science, there is actually definite changes going on as a result of climate. Uh, and I think it, that the data dealing with ticks and mosquitoes is much less controversial. Um, this is a topic that a lot of people don't actually argue about. And so when you bring up things like climate change relating to public health, ticks and mosquitoes, generally people are all behind the idea of getting rid of them or, or minimizing them. Um, and so it, it can in some ways be, I don't wanna say a unifying scientific premise, but at least it may help to kind of diffuse some of the climate debate a little bit because we actually do have really good um, empirical data that, that this is occurring. And so in general with climate, uh, as, it, as it gets warmer, we have milder winters. That means that we frequently have later winters when the snow comes down, and it's not uncommon for us now to find black-legged ticks here in Maine in late November, early December, or some years even early January along the coastal plain. And we're looking at areas like Wells, Kennebunk, Scarborough, Falmouth. Um, that was certainly not the case in the early 90s. Traditionally then, the season for ticks would end frequently by Thanksgiving, um, but, but it is common for us now to be able to go down because we have no snow and our average daily temps are around 40 degrees in, in early December a lot of times, and the ticks are positively happy to be out there doing that. Uh, this also means that we can have springs where the season will start a lot earlier. 2012 was a year when we had 70 degree temperatures starting at the beginning of March, and really almost on the last day of February, the ticks were out in big numbers. This contrasts in years when it's colder, when frequently the ticks may not start until the beginning of April. So they, there can be years where the tick season is almost encompassing nine to 10 months out of the year now, especially on the coastal plain in Maine. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> as it warms, what we're going to see is the change here in southern Maine is not gonna be all that apparent as far as ticks because like it or not, you guys are loaded with them down here on the southwestern coast. They're everywhere and there's not really a way to completely get rid of them from the landscape once they've established. However, as we showed in the map earlier, they are emerging in other parts of the state, particularly the Downeast area as well as Northern Maine. And this is probably, as time goes on, where we will see the greatest impact uh, will be in the ticks emerging and expanding in Northern areas. Also adding to that is the fact that right now, if you look at Northern Maine, um, it's actually in generally cold enough that the deer abundance in Northern Maine and down Eastern Maine is actually quite low. Uh, we're talking in some cases around two to five deer per square mile. Um, in some, or, and so the state has an idea of a management plan to increase deer densities in Northern regions to about 10 per square mile. But it's very difficult because the overwintering conditions don't promote deer survival. That may change as it gets milder, meaning deer are gonna be more successful, meaning that you have potentially more hosts for ticks to uh, attach to and, and reproduce. 
So, um, in general, though, what I'm going to do now is jump to a study that we have looking at overwintering of both black legged ticks and uh, lone star ticks here in Maine. We have a companion site in Hamden, Connecticut. Our study site is based in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, which is right next to Portland, and this is a project that was funded by the Northeast IPM Center from 2016 to 2018, working in conjunction with the Connecticut Ag Station. Now, we call it a tick overwintering study, and we say that we're monitoring the survival of ticks that are buried under different climatic conditions, um, such as a leaf litter depth and, and snow depth at these tick sites. However, a lot of this involves the really great activity of going out and shoveling snow. So as much as science might sound really cool, in practice, a lot of it can be very basic things you're doing to actually get that data. But essentially what we did, we put ticks in these small, what we call them tick pots or tick enclosures right here, placed out in the woods, and we have different treatments. So one of the treatments was we have leaf litter that would remain inside the tick pot, insulating ticks in these small vials. In some cases, the leaf litter was removed. In some cases, snow was removed after every snowfall, so we would dutifully go out after shoveling off all of our houses, we would then go to work and shovel more snow out in Cape Elizabeth, essentially leaving some of these pots completely open and exposed to cold ambient air temperature. Some, however, would remain under the snow and would benefit from the insulation provided by, by a deep snow cover. And we monitored the survival of both scapularis and amblyoma at these sites. In general, survival was much higher, and this is survival, percent survival of, of scapularis, um, in Connecticut and Maine in 2016-2017. In general, Connecticut, because of the milder conditions present on the ground, there was an increased survival in Connecticut. However, our sites did pretty good in general. And of course, there were differences in years. Some of the differences in years result are a result of, of colder ambient air temperatures that occurred. However, one of the things that we do see happening with climate change, even though there's an overall appearance that ticks may overall benefit, we actually can have periods where the temperatures may be still cold, but you may have a day of mild conditions. And so, for instance, on uh, January 9, 2017, our site was really loaded with snow. On the 10th and 11th, we had fairly warm temperatures, close to 40 with rain. So on the 13th, we actually had complete bare ground on our study site in January. Any subsequent cold would, could therefore um, impact the ticks and cause higher mortality because of a lack of, of snow insulation uh, that might occur. In general, however, sites that remained with their leaves and had their snow had overall greater survival. Ones that had less survival were ones where the leaf litter was removed and snow was removed. So as a very practical thing, <clears throat> anybody here that, that um, lives or, or is, has a home where you actually have to do leaf raking in the fall, and I'll admit I hate raking leaves at my property. I love it when the wind comes in and just takes them all off. Um, but leaf raking is actually turning out to be a fairly important tick control um, technique around homes. Um, you get rid of that leaf litter around the peridomestic environment, you're actually going to open up the ground, make it more exposed to sun and more wind, and the ticks, as a consequence, don't survive. So keeping your leaves around your home may actually provide very good tick habitat in, in the peridomestic environment. Um, so overall, between Connecticut and, and Maine, um, what we see is that 94% of the ticks of scapularis survived. 94% uh, survived when we had leaves and snow on sites, in general, 77% um, survived when both leaves and snow were removed. Now generally, black-legged ticks, Xodes scapularis, our, our deer ticks, are very habituated to northern climates. Uh, they in, in many ways are thought to be a temperate species that actually survived the Ice Age on coastal islands off of Massachusetts and then re-emerged after the Ice Age <coughs> uh, into parts of the Northeast and now stretching over to the Mississippi. So they're very northerly acclimated. This contrasts a lot with what we see um, with Lone Star ticks. <clears throat> and in general, Lone Star ticks are making an appearance, as I said, in Connecticut, where they have found now established populations in the last two years, in some cases, kind of an insidious um, infestation. Because in, in one site in Connecticut, uh, there was a site of, an, of a peninsula where there was an extent power station, a nuclear facility that was closed off to the public, fenced. Um, and so generally abandoned. And there was not a whole lot of traffic there. And the ticks were not discovered until they found wildlife dying. And in particular, there were a couple of deer that had so many ticks burdening them that their eyes closed from an immune response to the swelling, so they actually couldn't see. They walked out into a road and got struck by cars. And so when they examined the deer, they found thousands of these Lone Star ticks 
occupying the carcasses. When they went into the site where the deer had reportedly come from, one of the guys in Connecticut said that it looked like just a, a wildlife cemetery. There were bones just all over the place. Because these ticks, um, unlike scapularis, these ticks are a big livestock pest and they can actually exsanguinate or at least go towards drawing a lot of blood off of large hosts causing health issues. And so that appears to be happening at this site in Connecticut. Um, and so it is something that it also, while a human pathogen and a human health issue, we now bridge the gap into wildlife health. And, and one of the things with vector-borne diseases that I do want to talk about is that there is a concept now called a one health concept, and that is environmental health, uh, human health, and, and frequently animal health. And the animal could be domestic or wild, but here we see an example of a wildlife or a one health problem where we have things like climate change, which could be environmental health, affecting wildlife health, as well as human health, where these ticks um, get established. And so <clears throat> with Lone Star ticks, we actually do find that we have had a, a, a small number of submissions to our lab over the years uh, looking at ones that were not associated with travel. And in a lot of cases, these are um, people have found uh, adult Lone Star ticks on themselves, frequently not on pets, however, on themselves. And what we suspect is the very small number that we see are actually ones being brought in by birds that have survived and, and are now questing we don't yet have a record of an established population. We have found small numbers of them up around the Brownfield area over by Freiburg and Conway, New Hampshire, and then a small number also in uh, Cape Elizabeth and Scarborough, but again, no indication yet that there is um, an established population. However, Lone Star ticks are, another reason for concern about them is that um, there is a new uh, syndrome that has been discovered with Lone Star ticks. So I will just throw out a question. How many people here like Pork. How many people here like steak? Anybody like venison? How about your hamburgers? Okay. One of the things they've discovered with Lone Star ticks, which apparently has only been discovered in the last five years, is that there are people now reporting, and this is actually very common where these become established, people after getting a Lone Star tick bite have developed a red meat allergy. And the tick bite itself, there's something in the tick saliva, produces a response against a carbohydrate in, in the flesh of hoofed mammals, and the carbohydrate, I believe, is called alpha-gal. And what it means is that people, seven to eight hours after eating a steak, a burger, pork chop, some venison, moose, camel, goat, anything hoofed mammal, they develop an intense allergy that no one, I don't think there's been a fatality reported yet of it, but certainly there have been severe allergic reactions. And there is not enough data yet to say when this allergy goes away, although people that are more exposed to these Lone Star ticks have a greater sensitivity to the allergy. Um, and so, of course, you know, you could always make the joke that PETA really loves Lone Star ticks now. But, um, but really, it's actually a very serious problem. And apparently, where these ticks are established, especially in areas like Long Island, New York, allergists are reporting that the alpha-gal allergy is the most common allergy that they're seeing now coming through their offices. Um, so it is something that, that is a concern. We've actually had a couple of reported cases of alpha-gal. There was somebody in the mid-coast that had reported one and then someone else in the Augusta area. However, because this is not a disease condition, it's not reportable. And so a lot of times physicians don't necessarily report this to the state. So a lot of times we get the information second or third hand. So actually following up with some kind of investigation about this is a little difficult. But it is something that our state health department is taking more seriously as a concern, especially as these ticks could potentially make their way um, into Maine. So getting back to the tick survival study, for a long time the party line was that Maine was too cold for Lone Star ticks. That we had winters that were just too cold for them to survive and they wouldn't be a problem here. However, with our tick study, our tick enclosure study, the second year into the study, we decided to add Lone Star ticks into the mix. And what we found was that the Connecticut site had a much higher rate of survival, sometimes cresting close to 80% of the Lone Star ticks in their tick pots survived. And for us, however, we actually had Lone Star ticks surviving. A very small amount, we're looking at cresting at close to 10% of the ticks survived, but that's still 10% of the ticks. So 10% of the Lone Star ticks that are going to get imported every year could potentially establish themselves based on just climate. They need available hosts such as white-tailed deer, but there is the potential for these guys to get established, at least in southern Maine. Um, and if they do, then it is certainly for us a game changer and it becomes much more serious from a public health perspective.
1981 to 2010, they, there were folks down in um, Oklahoma looking at degree day maps, trying to predict where um, Lone Star ticks could establish themselves. And lo and behold, the Cape, Long Island, and parts of Connecticut were areas that had enough accumulated degree days for Lone Star ticks to survive. This map has not been updated yet, but it is something that, that folks are looking into to see um, because as there have been some gradual increases in temperature since the study has been published, and it'll be interesting to look and see where in New England now we have a uh, possible uh, range expansion potential for, for this tick. And so even though we do talk about deer ticks and we do talk about Lone Star ticks, we have 15 different species of ticks that we know of occurring in Maine right now. Many are ones you'll never bump into because they're very host specific. We have one tick that lives just on offshore islands, 10 miles off the coast, feeding on puffins and razorbills and guillemots, and you'll never bump into it unless you wanna go out and handle puffins. Uh, we have another tick that is recently, recently recognized and described in the late 90s uh, called Ixodes gregsoni that is only found on mustelids. So unless you're actually directly working and handling weasels and mink and fisher, you're not gonna bump into this tick but we do have it on the landscape. However, deer ticks, black-legged ticks, we know that they vector several pathogens now in Maine, and certainly we have Lyme disease. We have a new Borrelia called Borrelia miyamotoi, which is a sort of a relapsing fever spirochete, which we have case reports of occurring. Babesiosis has been endemic in coastal Cumberland and York County for about 20 years. And then Anaplasma, Phagocytophilum, a, a pathogen that causes human or canine anaplasmosis, um, is widespread now in the state. And then finally, we have a uh, virus, uh, actually the only virus we have transmitted by scapularis in North America is one called Powassan virus, also known as deer tick virus, which we do have cases of. Um, we have another kind of tick called the American dog tick. This is the very common tick that people find in the springtime. They're much larger than deer ticks, and when you encounter them, it's not uncommon to get 20 or 30 at a time if you go off into a grassy area and you bump into them. For us, they're just a pest species, but as you go in other parts of the country, they do carry uh, tularemia and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And then finally, this is the list of ones carried by our Lone Star ticks. So one called Master's Disease, which is another Borrelia, also called Borrelia Lone Star Eye. There's a spotless fever, and then a type of relichiosis, which is uh, a rickettsial disease like anaplasma that this uh, Lone Star tick also carries, in addition to the red meat allergy. So these actually do form um, you know, quite an important component of, of public health. Um, and the one thing I do wanna say, let's see if I can do this right. Um, there are new pathogens being found all the time in, in these ticks. Um, part of that has to do with increased and better technology, better sequencing, better molecular techniques that allow us to actually detect these pathogens. Um, some of it, though, could be the emergence of new pathogens in nature. Um, and we also certainly also have other ticks as well. There's a brand new tick that was found in the country in the U.S. Um, in 2017 called the Asian longhorn tick that was probably imported into the country by um, one theory at least, is that dogs that were rescued from the meat trade in Asia were brought here as pets and companion animals. The quarantine on those animals are not as strict as livestock, so it is possible that these ticks were introduced to the country through adopted companion animals. Um, they are a tick that survives um, without mating, so they are parthogenic, so they can reproduce on their own without the need of a mate. And they have now been found from an initial site in New Jersey. They've now been found in seven different states, uh, the closest being Connecticut and also New York. It is something that we worry about because at least in Asia, it is a big concern for uh, public health. And so again, we do have a changing distribution in Maine from, from Ixodes scapularis. And of course, one of the big questions is why that is. 100 years ago, Maine was primarily, and most of the Northeast looked like this, open farmland. We had no forests. And, and black-legged ticks, our deer ticks, are creatures of forests. They are very susceptible to desiccation, and they dry out very easily with sun and wind. And so without a forest overstory and a shrub layer, they don't survive all that well. So there weren't a whole lot of them present on the landscape when a lot of New England was active, for, uh, active agriculture. Um, however, as agriculture has gone by, there has been a slow reforestation, so that now a lot of the Northeast is a forested landscape. Uh, and as a consequence of the forested landscape, 
White-tailed deer have also increased in numbers. And it was a big thing back in the 1800s when someone saw a white-tailed deer in Bangor or Portland, it made headline news in the, in the newspapers because they were such a rare event to actually see deer. Whereas now, they're in many ways becoming almost a pest species. And the controls on them are either hunting or the grill of an SUV, generally. Um, and so there's not a whole lot to prevent them from expanding. Um, so they're important, though, because they do provide, deer provide the major um, reproductive blood meal for deer ticks to establish. While the bacteria is present in a lot of different wildlife, primarily rodents as well as birds, um, white-tailed deer do not provide any contribution to bacteria for the ticks. But they do provide the overall engine that allows um, the tick population to increase. And so when we look at tick production, we find that white-tailed deer um, are about 90% of the blood meals of adult deer ticks are white-tailed deer. To a lesser extent, other species such as dogs, either domestic or feral, coyotes, bear, moose, people, and domestic or feral cats may also to some extent provide that the same role that white-tailed deer do. Generally, their densities are never as high. And hopefully, the densities of people having ticks on them that long uh, so that the ticks actually reproduce is hopefully not very high either. Hopefully, most people find the ticks on them before the ticks get a full blood meal and drop off. Um, but in many cases, adult ticks tend to really prefer white-tailed deer evolutionarily. The role of reservoir hosts such as rodents is occupied by a wide variety of species, however. So white-footed mice are our most commonly reported, but many squirrel species, red squirrels, gray squirrels, chipmunks, and flying squirrels may also act as the reservoir for a lot of the tick-borne pathogens, as well as shrews and also bird species. Commonly, we see common yellow throats, wrens, uh, robins, or other thrushes such as viris also provide very good reservoir competence for both uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, the agent of Lyme disease, as well as Anaplasma phagocytophilum, the agent of anaplasmosis. Um, so there is a wide, wide range of potential reservoirs that the ticks can feed on, but generally the real bottleneck for the population tends to be their ability to feed on, on white-tailed deer. And of course, as I said, a number of white-tailed deer were increasing. They went from a historic highs pre-colonial period down to quite low numbers in the Northeast and then are slowly back on their ascension going into the 1900s and, and now the 21st century uh, to the point that there are actually many control programs being done uh, in, in areas because deer have become such a high pest. Okay, I heard a couple of people groan, right? Isn't this a cool slide, right? Okay, so what we have, <coughs> we have an adult deer being brought into probably a tagging station or, or a, 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 vet, a wildlife vet clinic. And here we have all of these adult ticks feeding. Now, notice the artful presentation of female adult ticks in this nice circle, fully engorged. Each of these female adult black-legged or deer ticks is capable of producing up to 3,000 young. So if you need to think about this, this is like tick caviar, right? Eggs, tick eggs. So one deer, potentially, can have 100 ticks, 3,000 young. You're looking at one deer could potentially result in 300,000 new ticks being born. When the deer densities in some parts of southern Maine get to be 50 per square mile, 60 per square mile, which we do have in some areas of York County because of a lack of hunting uh, and lack of access to hunting and no predators for deer, the potential can actually be quite high for, for the tick numbers uh, to increase. And of course, many studies have looked at how to reduce deer and how that might be an impact. In general, this has not been feasible on most mainland settings. However, on islands or peninsulas, they have found that with a reduction of deer, you may actually have a reduction in ticks. Um, one of the studies, one of the first studies that I helped with at the lab way back from 1998 to 2000 with my previous supervisor, Dr. Peter Rand, um, was to actually take my college education in wildlife and go out and count deer scat. So I actually had to go out and count deer poop in the woods for about three years. And then we looked at those number of deer uh, sign and actually correlated that to a deer density. And then we went back and also collected ticks in those areas. And we found that where deer numbers got to be quite high, and so we're looking at kilometer wise, 40 per square kilometer, 50 per square kilometer, the number of ticks was actually quite high in these study areas. As deer numbers went down below 10 per square kilometer, the number of ticks began to drop precipitously as well. Now this also comes into the realm of policy. And so the one thing that, that we don't work on a whole lot of scientists is a lot of policy work, but at the state level, 
Many state agencies are actually looking at policies to manage their deer numbers, as well as numbers of moose and bear and wild turkeys, because these are all important game species. However, the deer management in the last 20 years has now taken on a big component of it relating to vector-borne diseases. And the number of discussions involving Lyme disease and ticks in these meetings about how to get your deer density to a certain level are becoming much more important and much more common. And it is something that the state also hears about in, in trying to manage white-tailed deer. We have seen that there are rare studies where people um, on an island have taken the, the broad step of, taking rid of getting rid of all the deer on the island. And as a consequence, shown by this black line on Monhegan Island, the tick numbers went down into the cellar two or three years after the final deer was removed from Monhegan. Um, again, this is not necessarily feasible in a mainland setting, but it is something that is possible for communities, especially offshore island communities, a lot of which we work with because uh, on an island, there's a lot more actual management you can do per square area um, than in, in, a, in a residential mainland setting. So again, this comes back frequently, however, when the topic of wildlife comes up to managing, and it comes back to the question, do you want to take care of reservoirs or do you want to take care of the reproductive hosts? Unfortunately, what happens a lot of times is that this becomes almost a, a debate where people come down on one side or the other of the issue. And I think this does a big disservice to public health because we look at this as very much, uh, the, the new term now is integrated tick management. At one time it was used more broadly, integrated pest management, where the idea is that you take every tool in the toolbox you have available to you and you apply it to a problem. So even though there are some folks that want to reduce deer, there are some folks that want to treat mice because they have the reservoir potential. Um, I think what happens is you have a much better chance of controlling ticks if you're doing both. And then you throw into the mix things like taking care of the tick's habitat. If you reduce your invasive species, your Japanese barber, your Eurasian honeysuckle, you're reducing a lot of good tick habitat in your forests and you're doing the added benefit of getting rid of invasive shrubs as well, which are incredibly problematic. The other concept that comes in with tick management a lot is that we have to look at, at pesticides. So there has been the development of things that people can do around their homes. One thing is if you have a lot of mice and chipmunks and you have a lot of woods on your property, you can deploy host targeted strategies like the Max Force box, uh, also known as the Select Tick Control System. Essentially there's a nice tasty bar of peanut based um, butter and sugar inside this, probably looks a lot like a peanut butter cup without the chocolate on it, inside this box. As the mice and the chipmunks run inside, they get coated by a wick that has a lot of the same top spot materials you may give to your cats and dogs to kill ticks. So these are placed around homes in enough of a density, you need about six per acre, so they go around homes in areas where you have a lot of, a lot of mice and chipmunks, and the thought is that you can actually reduce the number of infected ticks in a residence um, by employing these boxes. Many ways this is good because this is a self-contained box, so there's no leakage of the pesticide inside. Many people that are concerned about the broad application of pesticides, especially broad spectrum pesticides, will go with this instead because you're talking about a very targeted and focused application only on mice and chipmunks. So there is that added benefit um, as well. However, they're pricey. One box costs about 80 bucks and this box again needs about five or six more companions to adequately treat your property. So it actually can get quite pricey um, for homeowners by the end of the season that they're worried about. However, there are a bunch of other strategies. <coughs> and as much as it may be a uh, kind of a flashpoint for a lot of people, there are pesticides that can be applied. Now the one thing I will say about the application of pesticides, because we're running down on time, we were in a better place to apply pesticides 10 years ago than we were now. Before the economic downturn in 2008, there were several small companies that were producing botanical pesticides. So these are pesticides based off of oils derived from vegetable matter. Uh, rosemary, wintergreen, garlic oil, things like that were produced, some of which were actually fairly effective at controlling ticks. However, with the economic downturn, many of these companies went under and the, and the production of these compounds went away. And so when subsequent companies have tried to reinvigorate these products, they haven't proved to be as effective, probably because of uh, patent licensing. They can't get the original formulations down. So in many cases, a lot of the botanicals that people are using are not as effective as they used to be. So as a consequence, they result with um, kind of a broad spectrum synthetic pesticide, which people are, tend to be using now. 
However, habitat management, and this is certainly very important in, on municipal properties where people are getting exposed, so school grounds, town forests, active recreation trail areas, certainly doing your trail maintenance, opening up your trails, getting rid of your leaf litter or brush is important. Education is important. Many communities, especially land trusts, as well as, as town municipal properties, will post signage talking about the risk of, of having ticks in areas. Um, and then finally, there are some people, in, not in Maine, but in other parts of the U.S., that are using things called a four-poster device. These are actually acting like the bait boxes for mice, but they work with white-tailed deer. So you put these, these, essentially these trough feeders out, deer come in and they put their heads around these essentially paint rollers, which are coated with a carousel. There's a feed in the bottom of these troughs, and so as they come in, they get hit with the rollers and it actually kills the ticks that are on the white-tailed deer. Um, this is beneficial in very small amounts because you are actually controlling ticks. However, you have to use food for the deer in order to attract them, which means you're actually burgeoning the tier, deer herd by supplementally feeding them so it's kind of a catch-22, um, especially in areas where hunting is unfeasible or very unpopular. These have been proven to work to reduce tick densities. Uh, however, there is an ongoing debate whether or not they should be licensed in Maine. Um, and so the only other thing I want to say about deer, uh, in addition to having a problem with Lyme disease, they are also reservoirs of other vector-borne, particularly mosquito-borne diseases. Jamestown Canyon virus and Cache Valley virus are two um, that are on the rise in the Northeast. And in fact, we've actually had cases of Jamestown Canyon virus in the last two years in Maine. Um, deer actually act as a reservoir for this and mosquitoes bite deer and then bite people as a consequence. Cache Valley is also a virus that's being found now in more numbers in Connecticut and New York State. Probably under-recognized, so we may actually have it here. It just hasn't been discovered yet. But it is something that folks do need to think about uh, because certainly ticks as well as mosquitoes don't really respect um, political boundaries. Um, and so they tend to be tied more to environmental issues. However, just as a take home, we know that climate is a big issue. And it is something that, again, does not respect political boundaries. Um, and the ticks and mosquitoes don't either. And so I think there really is a need to focus on this kind of work for climate change arguments. Because uh, many people don't want to hear about climate change, but they are really concerned about ticks getting on themselves their kids, and their pets. And so I think that it is something that people should really explore um, a lot more. And then finally, a lot of the battle against ticks really comes down to each and every one of us. Um, it's not so much that the federal CDC is gonna fly in with a cape and take care of all the ticks that are in an area. Really, a lot of us all have our own responsibility. If we're going out to go outside and recreate or go outside and spend time in our homes, there are personal protection measures all of us can do. And, and it's a pretty telling fact that even though our lab, we go out a lot to do tick survey work and mosquito work, very few of us have ever come down with Lyme disease because we really dress appropriately, we apply repellents, and more importantly, we do tick checks when we come in from the field. Um, and you know, one of the big sayings we have is know your freckles and know your moles, because if you get a new mole or a freckle on Wednesday, it wasn't there on Tuesday and it has eight legs, it's probably a tick. So keep an eye out for it. Also, coming in from the field, those of you who are doing work, doing field work, doing gardening, recreating, many people think you should go and wash and dry your clothes when you come in. This actually is not going to be that effective to reduce ticks. What you should do first, put your clothes in the dryer first for a half hour to an hour on a high cycle, and that actually dries out the ticks on your clothing. Because if you just throw them in the wash with regular detergent, they are going to be undeterred. Um, you know, Tide and, and Arm and & Hammer don't kill ticks. They are really happy in your lint trap, just crawling around, all nice and hydrated. Um, so put, put clothes in the dryer first. That will kill the ticks that are on your clothes. And then throw them in the wash to get rid of them. And then also, you know, certainly a lot of the tick checks that we do should also be applied to your pets. And we get a lot of reports of people getting tick exposure from cats and dogs. How many people here have cats? How many people here have dogs? How many of you, your dogs, love to jump on the couch or the bed? Right? And guess what jumps off the dogs that come on the bed? Ticks. So, you know, they certainly are a, a mechanism for people to be exposed, and you should be checking them as much as you checked you or, or your kids as well. And finally, ticks don't jump or fly. They are just waiting with open arms for you. <laughs> they are the consummate hitchhiker, just waiting. So, um, I guess with that, I can take any questions. Okay. Yes. Um, just the note about DEET. 
Yes. So what would you recommend for children? Because I have young kids, and yep. I've always been told PE is not good for kids. Sunscreens right. and sprays. And yep. Um, so they actually do have, there is actually a botanical lemon oil of eucalyptus, um, which you can buy commercially. Um, and it actually works pretty well for, as, as a repellent for both ticks and mosquitoes. Um, the one thing with the, the botanicals, like lemon oil of eucalyptus, is usually the reapplication is sooner. It tends to break down or get sweated off a lot quicker than DEET. The other thing is DEET can go on clothing and be allowed to dry just fine. A lot of the issue with DEET is a direct application of it on the skin. So you can certainly apply it to clothing, though, and let that dry, and then that should be fine as an issue. Um, and it's while it's getting warmer as well. Yeah, um, I think deer ticks do have the ability to adapt because they're, they're not being found into Canada. They do find them into Quebec in areas around Montreal and Ontario. Um, it's, it's a big question whether or not the lone star ticks are going to be able to adapt to that as well. I mean, they, they always historically have been very susceptible to cold temperatures um, because they're actually more of a tropical tick. They actually originated down close to Mexico. Um, and so I think that they're not as adaptable the cold temps, but it'll mostly be a question of time to see whether or not that, that actually happens. And the other question, I'm interested in that meat allergy or beef yeah. animal yeah. allergy. Yeah. What kind of symptoms do people um, swelling, demonstrate? Swelling, like you would have like an almost an anaphylaxis, um, but then also the closing of the throat as well. Um, so, and I think, I think, however, a regular EpiPen, I think, is, is supposed to be considered okay, but I'm not exactly sure. I'm, I'm not a medical doctor. Well, that'll get people being more plant-based. Well, that actually sort of is the, the closet joke about some of this, yeah. Vegetarians are fine. Sorry. I actually don't need the microphone, thanks. So a lot of times I've heard that like peppermint oil can be really good for either like getting a tick off your skin or being a deterrent. Is that true or is that just another one of the old wives' tales? Wait, can I do this? I can do this. All right. Okay, so. Here's all the stuff that people call about to say they want to be able to put on, on themselves to take a tick off. I know, right? And where's the, where's the pointer? So the thing, where is it? Wait a minute. Where is it? Somewhere in here, expired credit card, because you know you don't want the ticks to grab your identity, right? Do identity theft. So the deal with, with peppermint oil, but also Vaseline, um, olive oil, I think peanut butter and butter are in there somewhere. The idea is that you're going to smother the tick so it can't breathe. Ticks, however, only breathe like once every three or four minutes. So it takes a long time for them to actually get uncomfortable enough that they are gonna want to not bite you. Now the other thing with ticks that a lot of people don't know, their beak, the actual thing that bites people, actually has a lot of fish hooks, recurved hooks on them. So they're actually anchored into your skin. So they, don't, they can't pull out of you the way a mosquito or a black fly will if it's feeding. So it actually takes a little bit of time for the tick to work its way out to be able to come out of your skin. So as a consequence, when pulling a tick out, and again, pulling the tick is probably going to be your best method, but a gentle tugging as opposed to a quick rip is going to be much more effective because what happens a lot of times when people quickly try to take a tick out very fast, um, the beak or the head may remain under the skin. Uh, there's no issue with disease transmission with that, but there is an issue with like a sliver or uh, you know, a, a thorn or something where you have foreign matter now under your skin which you can get a secondary infection from. Um, so, you know, really using, there's a lot of commercial tick pullers now which are used, a lot of vets will, will give them out. Um, they actually work pretty effectively at getting ticks off. They're, they're great for pets, but they also work on people. But then also getting a really fine pair of tweezers. And honestly, that's what we use more often than not, is a very fine pair of tweezers just to tug the ticks out, so. I actually was kind of bummed I didn't get to put this up, but you know. Also, don't use lit cigarettes or hot matches. Don't do it, <laughs> just don't. Yeah. So there's a, a big push now to use more native plants yes. in landscaping. Yep. Um, so, uh, like prairie meadow. Yep. Kind of Well, what happens with, with a lot of the invasives is it's not so much that they're magic shrubs, that like, if you plant them, all of a sudden ticks just appear, but they, because the invasives tend to form such a dense, thick shrub understory, they actually provide much more protective cover for the ticks. So the actual humidity levels um, and, and the temperature levels are much more accommodating for the ticks under these shrubs. 
and with our, a lot of our natives, they don't have that kind of thick presence. So a lot of raspberries or blueberry bushes, they're a lot more diffuse, and so they don't have a lot of the similar beneficial habitat characteristics. So in many ways, the natives are just better to plant anyway because it just is slightly less hospitable. It doesn't mean you're gonna get rid of all your ticks by planting native vegetation, but the overall numbers may, may decrease somewhat, so. Right. What's the difference between those species of ticks? Um, in some cases, they have evolved with, with the pathogens. Um, you know, there's a, there's a thought that we have other species of ticks that don't bite people. And there's a couple that are in the same genus as our black-legged ticks. One, one, they don't even actually have common names because they're so infrequent. But a couple of them cycle just quietly in rodent populations. And so a lot of people think that Originally, these were the ticks that actually started the tick-borne cycles because they would just pass between rodents and these ticks, rodents and these ticks, rodents and these ticks. And it wasn't until you get a tick like Scapularis that comes in that actually likes people that brought the disease out of the rodent reservoir populations and into the human or, or vet realm. Um, and so in a lot of cases, uh, these other ticks may cycle pathogens, um, but they don't bite people, so they're not a disease issue. So that's, that's one of the major issues right there. So, yeah. Yeah, Noah. Oh. Is there empirical evidence that backyard chickens Oh, right. <laughs> so <clears throat> how many people here know who Christy Brinkley is? She may see this actually, this is posted on the web. But, so Christy Brinkley is actually an author, a scientific author on a paper. And, and so she actually did a, a study where they, they put um, guinea fowl and, and birds out and they, they looked at um, how the effect on, on chickens on ticks. And they found that in, in enclosed areas on her estate that the natural numbers of ticks went down in these enclosed areas. There is, however, no empirical evidence for field studies, like widespread over the landscape, that you're actually impacting um, tick numbers. The big thing with deer ticks is they're so small that there's, there's a big concern that, that the chickens don't actually see deer ticks, especially the nymphal deer ticks, which are the size of the head of a pin. Now, they may be effective at controlling Lone Star ticks, which are bigger and much more noticeable, or dog ticks, which are also quite a bit larger as well. Um, but it's sort of like one of those projects that we always want to do. And that when we put it in, Maine Med kind of looks at us like we're from Mars because we were talking about wanting to work with chickens, you know, and stuff. Um, as a chicken owner, however, I can say that chickens do completely devastate the landscape in, in their coops and their pens. <laughs> they take care of everything. So it is possible that even if they don't eat the ticks, they certainly could be denuding the vegetation enough to make it inhospitable for ticks in small areas. A lot of bare soil, a lot of bare sand, and ticks generally don't really like that a lot. So, okay. Yeah. It looks like you're all nice people. It's not that I don't want you all to move to Massachusetts, but you do have ticks. <laughs> yes. I just want to, I have Lyme disease, my wife has Lyme. Yep. I have two adult children that have Lyme. Yep. And that's fairly common, everybody. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's it's. But I want to leave you with a good note before I read today, all of you. Uh, there's two main doctors that treat Lyme disease, and they're two of the best in the country. One of them is coming to the Mid Coast Lyme Symposium next week. I think it's where is it? I don't know where it is. Is it Costa? Uh, no, I think it's in um, either Bethel or um, the. Might be in Bath. Ellsworth. Oh, Ellsworth, okay. Yep. Well, this doctor yep. is, is the keynote speaker. Yep. Uh, both of these doctors did their undergraduate work here at the University of New England. Mm. One of them, yeah. Dr. Tom Moorcroft from Connecticut, I was in his office, and I happened to look at one of his pictures up on the wall, yeah. and it was a picture of the point that we have out here. Right. And I yeah. of course, I recognized it right away. Yeah, I yeah. Myself years ago. But uh, I said to him, I said, Doc, did you go to the university? He said, yes, I did. Yeah. I said, well, why don't you go, down, go back, come back to the college, give some talks on that to yeah. those new students, because if you're going to be doctors or practitioners, social workers, you are going to be involved with Lyme disease on a major practice. Right? Yeah. So you should know. Yeah. The other doctor, his name is Dr. Lowry, he works with Harvard College, Harvard Medical yep. School. And he works at the uh, Spalding Rehab Center in Boston, mm. working with people. He is an under, he did his undergraduate 
Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and, and that actually brings up a good point. So um, both Colin and I were in the MPH program here at UNE. And so things like, a lot of people don't think about this necessarily when you're thinking about public health, but certainly the idea of, of vector-borne diseases, whether it's West Nile virus and mosquitoes or Lyme disease and ticks, it is something that certainly dumps into the public health realm. And so it is certainly an area, anybody that here is interested in public health, but you don't want to work with obesity as an issue, you know, certainly issues like this are, are incredibly important. And, and the other thing I, I would say as a take home, we don't know the next big issue that's coming down the pike. Um, three years ago, we didn't think Asian longhorn ticks were going to be an issue in the U.S. Five years ago, we weren't talking about Zika virus as, as, a, as a public health issue, and that appeared in 2016. So we, we have these new pathogens, these new pests that are always going to be introduced. And we don't know what they actually are going to be next, but we just know that they will appear in some form. So maybe one more question. So, yeah, so some of it is that there are better, so the question was um, the detection of new pathogens in ticks and, and why might that be? One, one big reason I think is because um, of the, the technology for detection is a lot better. Um, there were people that back in the 80s were talking about dissecting a tick and it would look like a galaxy under a fluorescent microscope because it had all these things that would light up on a fluorescent scope and some of them could be proteins, some could be viruses, some could be bacteria but they had no way of really detecting or, or determining what they were. And now with a lot of molecular techniques, you actually can determine or, or detect things a little easier. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is that, you know, there are certain conditions that, that may change. And we know that with Lyme, for instance, there were different strains of Lyme disease that occur. Some of these strains of Lyme disease are very tied to wildlife hosts. So mice and chipmunks might be responsible for strain one, two, and three but migratory birds may be more responsible for strains five, six, and seven. So depending on their particular abundance in a given year, you may actually see different strains appearing on the landscape. So there's a bunch of different factors that could play into that. Um, but I think the big thing really is, is advances in, in technology are, are making it better to detect, so. All right, great questions, everybody. Let's all give a very warm thanks to Sure. Uh, with Maine Medical Center Research and Vector Born People Lab is awesome. So thank you and thank you all for being here. I also want to give many thanks to our event sponsors and our event supporters. We were supported by Karen Husband and the Health, Wellness, and Occupational Studies Department. We were supported by Tina Brown and the Biology Department, Aaron Neptune uh, and the Office of Student Engagement, uh, Lee Cody and the Office of Communication. Alicia Curry and the Office of Sustainability, and also Zach Miller Hope and the Planetary Health Council. So, if you want to learn more uh, about the Planetary Health Council or join our work, you can visit our Facebook page, our uh, website on the UNE page, or contact our chair, uh, Zach Miller Hope at vhope at unee.edu. Thanks again to everybody for your time today.